Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we'll be looking at the final film in the Saw series, Jigsaw, and assessing a final set of John Kramer's traps. How are these going to stack up to the others? Let's start by unpacking the storyline to see what we can learn. Let's get to it. We open at the end of a high-speed chase. The suspect dips and bails, running to the rooftop of a nearby building, searching for an X. He holds off the bloodthirsty officers by informing them that if they don't summon Detective Halloran within 17 minutes, five people people are going to die. Halloran gets there, and despite a familiarity between the men, he can't help but to try to force the information from him. With talks breaking down, Edgar chooses to favor his own life, triggering the device and starting our games. We then transition coincidentally to five strangers wearing bucket hats, waking up in what appears to be a high-rent industrial complex, and chained to a cutting wall. A familiar voice whispers over the PA that this group is being offered the chance to cleanse themselves of their filthy lies. If they give blood, their life lights will go green and they'll be allowed to move on. With no further explanation, the saws wind up and they get dragged in toward the wall. Anna is the first to comprehend the situation and ends up squirting all over the floor, which releases her magical bucket. Once the recognition settles in, they all get to work, but Carly ends up giving a bit too much as a result of her struggling against it. The unfortunate sleeper never got the memo, and we get an uncharacteristic off-screen death as the rest of them are pulled into the next room. At the hospital, the detectives puzzle over why nothing happened when Edgar pulled that trigger. And with an overzealous officer putting a bullet right next to his heart, he won't be giving any answers for a while, or possibly ever. So they hit the streets to shake down any of his known associates. Back at the kill shack, they try to work some things out and figure out what up. Anna the Optimist points out that there is an advantage to the fact that they're playing a game. This game's gonna be one. Hey, that's the spirit. Meanwhile, in the broader world, we get a cool reveal that these games will impose themselves on the public, and thereby leave behind evidence to track. Halloran then rolls up on Logan, the badass coroner. He and Elle use their special handheld plasma cutters purchased specifically to propel their department into the 21st century, and find an entire cross-section of your boy's head missing. We then learn that the present here is 10 years post John Kramer. So in technological terms, anything goes. Detective Hunt and rolls in and we learn this trio has an interwoven series of histories together. But we can't get into details because Logan pulls a piece of evidence confirming this man was intended to die. They find on the USB drive an audio message charging them with ensuring that various sins against the innocent are atoned for. <laughs> Got it. At the shack, Demon Billy rolls out with a simple message. No, that's not creepy at all. And we are treated to some delightfully tone-appropriate comic relief. Before they can do any real reconnaissance, the chains start up again, so they all start blurting out what Whatever they think may be their most shameful transgression, with no clear impact. Luckily, Mitch notices a tape before it's too late. Just grabbing it disengages the pulleys, but they're horrified to discover the next stage disappears into the ceiling. The tape reveals one of them to be a filthy purse snatcher. The culprit must fess up and play the old pick-a-needle carnival game, with the options being saline solution, acid, or the antidote to the poison they were injected with. Carly gets noticeably stressed by this, allowing Ryan to easily out her. He tries to force the flu it's into her when she recognizes a number on one syringe that's the equivalent of her score from the robbery, $3.53. Despite this connection, she refuses to choose, and they all begin to get yanked on by their necks. Ryan is determined to save this, however, and swings over to hit her with all three syringes at once, releasing their necks while ensuring her demise. Sure enough, shortly after falling to the floor below, she begins to leak to death from the ears and eyes. Anna is beside herself about his actions, but they're all alive, and when they check the special syringe, there is what appears to be a combination to the door lock, so there is some balance here. Meanwhile, we learn that they used the dental records to ID the bucket pick. He was a bad man who owed some money to the wrong people, resulting in his wife getting killed. Also, the recording is confirmed to be John Kramer, so now they start to take this a little more seriously. Back at the farm, the combo works, allowing them to pass into a colonial farmhouse set. They chat a bit to figure what makes them all bad, and Anna has a hard time with this, claiming her husband was the one responsible for the worst thing that happened in her life. Then Ryan hits his limit and tries to smash his way out, falling into a trap that wires up his calf and slowly tightens down on him. Nearby, there is a tape. Mitch takes his time, trying to get this right, but the pulleys go back and forth, increasing the risk. Despite this, he reaches in very slowly and retrieves it. The message admonishes the trapster for trying to take a shortcut and recommends he pull the handle. Back with forensics, Elle notes the distinct presence of trace amounts of animal fecal matter on the victim's body. Then they learn there's another body from the same group, but with 
with no clear connection to the first victim otherwise. She has the mark of Jigsaw as well, and it gets them all tingly inside. As the detectives share some backstory, Hunt confirms that Logan had been tortured in Fallujah, which causes Halloran to wonder about his mental state. Back home on the farm, the way is revealed to them. Anna and Mitch enter the silo and use teamwork to get the remote, which also prevents them from escaping before the door closes. Both groups have a TV where Billy again critiques their selfishness and segues this into the next twist of the challenge. Ryan has to pull the lever in order to save the others. They then get to watch each other try to sort it all out. While that's going on, Halloran decides to feel things out a bit, charming Elle with a little casual sexual banter in the workplace. This makes his subsequent question about her whereabouts when the victim was murdered positively refreshing. Then he confides with Logan that there's a dark web forum for jigsaw freaks, and there were a lot of IP hits to the website from their internal system. They're trying to get something concrete on Elle, but then their labs come in and they have to run. They learn that the blood under the victim's fingernails match that of John Kramer's. A true mystery. This gives enough time for the silo to start filling up, but Ryan has settled on just staying put for now. Luckily, the grain does stop, but then they're forced to play human battleship with sharp metal objects. <laughs> Anna points out that if they die, Ryan is definitely going to die, which motivates him to go ahead and yank that lever, severing his leg but also opening multiple doors for them. As the sun goes down and their shifts come to an end, Logan finds his assistant at her favorite bar. Through a bit of talking, he discovers her alibi was bogus, and she lied because she has a hobby that makes her seem a likely suspect. He convinces her to show him, so she takes him to her secret studio, with Hunt following close behind. We see that this is where she goes to unwind and burn off her creative energies, recreating John's most beautiful contraptions. She even has a rare one that was discovered via his schematics, but wasn't known to have been used. They discuss this as Hunt takes some photos with his old-ass camera, while Edgar is woken up by an injection to his IV, and as Ryan screams over the loss of his favorite shin bone. As we enter a new day, Logan wakes up and shows off his nasty back scars from torture, and we get all caught up with new developments as Hunt is sent off to fulfill the commissioner's request quest to ensure John Kramer is dead, while Halloran learns of Edgar's disappearance overnight. At the barn, a tractor comes on. A closer inspection reveals a tape that's just for Mitch. He then gets pulled upward as the tape informs us that his sin was lying about the condition of his bike on Cycle Trader. Now he's got to get himself to the motorcycle brake handle without getting himself juiced. Fed up with fear and doubt, Anna Lara crofts her way over to the blender, but initially only provides encouragement. When that fails, she jams up the wheel for a bit so Mitch can continue to fail even under easier circumstances, which leads to him getting chewed up and spit out. Meanwhile, Hunt is on scene at the cemetery, ready to open the casket to rub it into these reporters' faces, except the casket contains Edgar. With that turnabout putting them on edge, they positively burst into Elle's studio, where they quickly find a secret room where she keeps all her best jigsaw tchotchkes, apparently including Mitch's body. Hunt goes for Logan, his old pal, and Logan is very very cooperative, in terms of casting aspersions at Halloran. This ends up working pretty well because Hunt is IA and has been investigating Halloran for some time for non-serial killer related offenses. By releasing Logan, Hunt is afforded the opportunity to collect additional evidence from Edgar's body, including confirmation that the slug that killed him likely came from Halloran's gun. Back at home, Logan gets a spooky drop-in from Elle, but it turns out her awkwardness is just excitement because she's located the game somehow, but since Halloran is their suspect, they can't call the cops. Plus, she has a huge gun, so he won't stand a chance. Unfortunately, he is following them. At the farm, Anna's trying to work through the next door. She pops it open, then squeezes her way in and pays for it. When she wakes up, she finds herself chained in a new room with Ryan and their abductor, the real John Kramer, here to administer one final test for them. Here we have a huge info dump revealing that Ryan was tangentially responsible for three deaths that he never fessed up to. John's mis fortune was primarily the result of his advanced cancer going unnoticed due to a mixed up chart, and he and Anna used to be neighbors. From the sounds of her frustration next door, John surmised that Anna killed her baby in a moment of delirious exhaustion and set it up to look like her husband did it on accident. Ellen Logan then pull up to Tuck's pig farm, the birthright of Jill Tuck, closed down due to a transmittable disease that Elle matched the samples of animal fecal matter they had, because your girl knows her shit. They head in right as Halloran rolls up and screams screens Hunt's calls. He had wanted to check in 
with them about the flesh puzzle they found in his icebox. John puts the finishing touches on the setup. After letting them know they've got it all backwards and that the shell is their key to freedom, we see the game only consists of a shotgun in the middle of the room. That other stuff is just for something else he's working on. Meanwhile, the others have been working their way through and arrive at that one unique trap. This causes Logan to become suspicious. But before she can convince him otherwise, Halloran pops in and takes control of the situation. Logan gets cute, but a pipe wrench evens that out. As the survivors try to work out what it all means, Anna takes the instructions to be a mandate to kill Ryan to set the scales of justice back on balance. But they've been doing things backwards, and a trick shot rips her face off. Inside the shell is your key to freedom. The way out, proving once again that Jigsaw is a master Riddler. Boy. Elsewhere, someone monkey shines Halloran. Then he and Logan wake up with some very fashionable collars. They're ordered to confess the reason they deserve to die in order to be released. This one's a direct feedback as John is all ears. They pull up, family feud style, and Halloran volunteers Logan, although I'm not sure that gains him anything. He then confesses that he was the one who messed up John's charts all those years ago. Despite this admission, the lasers turn inward. Well, hopefully he learned something. When Halloran gets his turn, there's just too much to choose from, so he lists it all. Somehow, he hit the correct one because his collar seems to turn off. But then Logan arises and we find out this was all a contrivance to get Halloran to admit that he killed innocent and people on tape, so Logan can blame all of this on him. The games that we watched occurred 10 years prior, when John was still alive. Logan was the sleepy fellow from the opening, about whom John had a change of heart. He then nursed him back to health, obligating him to take on the responsibility of being the next Jigsaw. He recreated the games in modern times with perps we only saw in death, and that would implicate Halloran, the man Logan blames for his wife's murder by Edgar, an informant kept on the streets due to Halloran's thirst for being fully informed. Logan had access to everything he needed to make it look like John was alive and set up the frame job. Through further flashbacks, we learn We can never come from anger or from vengeance that Logan never acquired any wisdom, and that he's been around from the start, so we should all like him. Then, with no consideration for how it fits into the overall plan, he allows Halloran's cranium to blossom. Well, I have a lot of thoughts about that one. Maybe we can get to some of them in our examination of the traps. Overall, this one looked good, but felt a bit sloppy, and I'm not sure it holds up to any sort of closer examination. You have to go brain off for this one. But regardless, let's figure out how to survive. We started our journey with the bucket head trap at the beginning. This is another in the series that relies on providing limited information. It appears these things were attached to their neck collars with some magnetic pins. They also set up in the beginning with the plasma torches that this was potentially going to utilize some sort of future tech. But we then learn that this happened in the past, so future tech is out. I do wonder if the magnetic pins could have been disengaged by using the opposite magnet from one of the other buckets. But I'm not sure you would have vision of it to be able to make that determination. Regardless, this is another simple one. The request was to give blood to move on. The first victim does so, blood falls on the floor and the saws retract. This is actually possible with modern technology, as there's a safety saw designed specifically to identify skin-to-blade contact and react within a fraction of a second. It's a very simple design that utilizes electrical signal from the metal of the blade coming in contact with flesh to jam itself up. It doesn't even distinguish. As an illustration, the company uses a hot dog to show how it works. This means that any of them could have just barely nicked themselves to stop the saw, and they could have done it for all all of them, including the sleeper. This is an easy one to pass through if you have the knowledge and are willing to give it a try, which is better than the alternative. Realistically, how else could it know that the right person gave blood, or a sufficient amount of blood, or whatever else? Even if John was watching, that's still pretty suspect. First off, the fact that we don't know if this was just a matter of the game master pulling switches in the background is a fault of the shoddy setup. I'm going to take advantage of that, because if you want to create a scenario with tension and uncertainty, you have to think your own way through any potential way to tie it off and then communicate that visually to us. Otherwise, it fails to connect. Further, if John was just watching via a camera and making his own choices about who made a reasonable sacrifice, wouldn't it then also be possible to just fake it? Move like you touched the wall, then cradle your arm and double over like you're in pain. But that seems pretty lame and non-technological for a jigsaw game. Next, we found ourselves in the barn, which started out as one thing but then transitioned to another. 
I don't know why they didn't spend as much time as they could searching around and trying to acclimate themselves to their surroundings. When we ultimately do finish up with an actual trap, we're presented with another one that seems poorly thought out. Carly is to inject one of the three syringes. The choice of the syringe represents the risk, as it could kill her, but then all their collars release. How does it know when she's done one? It could be there's a transmitter that registers a plunger making contact, closing the circuit and sending a release signal. In that case, a syringe just needs to be emptied rather than injected, and they can all get out of their collars and spend more time inspecting the clues and trying to figure out which of them is the correct combo to get out. But she did also have the problem that she had been injected with the poison. It wasn't just that one syringe killed, but also that she would passively die if she didn't cure herself. That's a simple matter of observation. Squeeze a little out of each one to test. The acid should be easy to identify. The other two are either saline or antidote, so you could potentially do a small sniff or taste test to confirm. Then stick that sucker in and live. The next room felt really contrived, which is saying a lot. It starts with the porch trap that locks up Ryan's leg. This is a contingent trap. It requires someone to attempt to break the rules in order to become ensnared. I do really question why he didn't try to quickly pull his leg out when the trap reversed momentarily, but maybe that was just surprise. Regardless, it seems like there could be an implement in here somewhere that could help them pull this thing apart or keep it from moving. The pulleys had holes in them. The wires chopped up the wood handle, but what if something more sturdy had been crammed through the holes themselves? Denying the pulleys the chance to gain momentum would have likely had a better effect. But it also leads me to wonder what would have happened if no one had stepped into it, or if he had just sucked it up and pulled the lever early. It was the one thing that ended the other game that got initiated, but that success was completely contingent on this secondary event that may have never happened or still been underway. Seems like an odd choice for setting up a trap. Without that, I'm not sure the silo trap is survivable. The grain part is horrifying, but then it stopped while they still had their heads up. Since they weren't buried, they likely could have avoided the sharp objects by just swimming over to the side of the silo where the space above them is covered by the TV. This would provide some protection and safety, but survivability from there is uncertain, sans lever. They may end up being stuck in there until they starve to death. The next disappointing trap is the motorcycle blender. This one is confounding. It seems like a trap that could have easily gone wrong at any initial step and resulted in not straight bringing Mitch up by his ankle. If everything goes to plan, you probably do need another person nearby, which he had in Anna, and she had the right idea. The motorcycle gear was fairly thin, and it makes sense to try to knock it off the rail or get it to stop or get crammed up in some other way. Possibly there's a control box or a wiring nearby that was used for the remote start that could be disengaged, but it's not clear. The primary factor preventing success is with Mitch's well-established habit of reaching for things really, really slowly, even when he's really close to reaching it. He did it with the tape player and does it again here with the brake lever. Take nothing for granted. Just because the trap momentarily stopped, don't presume it will stay stopped. Also, don't move and make yourself as thin as possible. He wasn't reaching any further at the end than he had been just before, but he got chunked up when the machine came back on. Why would that be? Unless he used his moment of pause to stretch out and puff himself up a bit. Huge mistake, as illustrated by the actual outcome in the movie. The last two obstacles are barely worth calling traps, and we won't spend too long discussing them. The shotgun was more of a riddle than a trap. And this speaks to the rule we established in another video of, if nothing's happening, do nothing. There's no timer, John just left. You're just chained up. Why the sudden urgency to take action and start busting? If there are trust issues with leaving the gun there, you could just unload the gun. This will give time for quiet contemplation without worry or distraction, and could even lead to you inadvertently figuring out the clues completely on accident. Really, you just have to keep your head on straight. If you're both in there for killing people, why would John want you to rectify that by killing another person? And then the laser collars. This is a bit of a sci-fi fantasy here, but an interesting concept. This was a retributive trap meant to kill, and while you're attached to the wall, the perpetrator is right there. Therefore, there are very few options open to you. If the circumstances were different, and we were just dealing with the collar itself, it seems the weakest part here is its frailty. You have these little knobs here turning around and pointing lasers all over. I'd start by just twisting on each of them and stripping out the gears that control their motion. The only true equivalent we have for judging future tech like this is sharper image. If they're anything like every item ever sold through sharper image, their construction is likely as delicate as a baby bird. Just break them and let them dangle. Well then, that was a lot of traps over time. TOT. I hope you have a lot of lessons tucked away for later. The quest for learning how to beat various horrendous situations marches on, but likely with fewer opportunities to directly address these types of elaborate dangers. Until the next episode, I hope this knowledge serves you well. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots.
I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks uncensored movie reviews of Life Force and Under the Skin, with others to be added over time. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.